listening to it at home before service began. So I've been singing all this morning then to walk in to the service and hear the praise team already singing rain on us, breathe on us, shower down, send your spirit. Just thinking about this, you know, we're in here in Southern California. It's like what they call fire season. It's really hot outside and kind of humid and the mountains are on fire. All the, the brush is very dry. And there's fires burning and smoke in the air. You can, you can smell it. There's an atmosphere. It's just kind of, it's kind of weird. But in the presence of God, there's, a, there's another kind of fire. And there's a different type of fire season. Season where the fire of God falls season where we're praying that God wouldn't put out the fire. Listen, he wouldn't put out the fire, but he'd also make it rain. In the book of 1 Kings, there's, a, there's an encounter where the prophet Elijah is confronting the spiritual wickedness of his day. And he lays before the Lord a, a sacrifice, and it's on dry wood. But then he instructs his servant just to do something a little strange. He says, pour some water on it. He said, do it again and do it again. I believe they do it seven times. And he's praying for the fire of God to fall, but he's also praying for this water, this baptism, if, if you will. And in the things of God, we pray that God shows up in times of our greatest need the way that he needs to show up. When things are dry and things no longer are producing fruit, we pray that the fire of God would come and burn away all the chaff, burn away all the excess. 
But then we also pray for that rain, for that saturating presence of God to wash us and cleanse us and to renew us and refresh us and revive us. So whatever season you find yourself in today, I pray that you'll pray that God will show up like that. Do you need God to show up like fire to burn away some doubt, some fear? Do you want God to show up and burn away some uncertainty and some of the things that have no more value? Or are you praying that God would just send a purifying, refreshing rain? As we pray today, as we go before the Lord together in prayer, first of all, I want you to prepare your sacrifice. Worship is a sacrifice. The Bible talks about the fruit of our lips, the sacrifice of our lips, the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips giving praise to God today. So as we pray for you, as I pray in this moment, let God hear your prayer as well. Go before the Lord the way that you can. Because the Bible says this, we don't really know how to pray the way we should. I don't really know what you need. And you may not even know what you really need, but there is a God who knows. There is a God who cares. There is a God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above even more than you can ever ask, think, or imagine. So Father God, this morning, hallelujah to your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. You alone are worthy, Father, to be praised. In the midst of the darkness, you continue to shine. Shine the light of your glory. Shine the light of your presence. Shine the light of your power, O oh God, so that your people never walk in darkness. Even though we have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For we know, Lord God, that you are always with us you abide in our heart father god when we speak your word father you abide in our praises when we open our minds and our heart you inhabit oh god the praises of your people and so we know lord that you are a very present help in time of trouble thank you lord for being the great shepherd that leads us beside calm waters that commands us to lay down, oh God, in green pastures. That restores our very soul. Thank you, Father, for the restoration that comes only from you. Like a cool drink of water. Like a refreshing, a refreshing spring of joy and hope and peace in the midst of our desert experiences. I pray, Father God, for every person that is watching right now, for those that might catch this broadcast later, for those, Father God, who might even hear about it by someone who watched it, let them know today, oh God, that you are still sitting on your throne, that while the world seems to be in chaos, while our nation is torn, Father God, we know that you are in absolute control of the kingdom that you have placed in our hearts. So Lord Jesus, rule and reign today. Reign in the sanctuary, Father, that we have prepared for you. Reign, Father God, in those places that we have relinquished control and we simply say, Lord, have your way. Have thine own way, O God, have thine own way. You are the potter, we are the clay. So mold us, Father God, make us Shape us after your will. And let us find ourselves, oh God, simply ready to be moved in the direction that you lead us. Ready, Father God, to receive instructions on how to live. If you tell us to wait, oh God, we'll wait. If you tell us to move, oh God, we move. If you tell us to suffer, oh God, we will endure because we know that all things are possible to them that believe. When we are weak, then you are strong. So in our weakness, Father, in our doubt, in our fear, in our humanity, we pray, oh God, that you will simply stretch forth your hand, that you will touch us where we need to be touched, oh God, that you will heal the brokenness in our lives, oh God, that you will restore the joy of our salvation, 
that you will renew our focus and strengthen our resolve. Be glorified, Father. Meet every need. Answer every prayer. Be a burden bearer like you said you would. Be a heart fixer, oh God, like you said you would. Show yourself compassionate to those who have strayed off track yet again. Bring us back. Revive, restore, renew your people in this hour. Father, I pray for this nation. I pray, oh God, for the United States of America. This land, oh God, in which all of us live, with all of its imperfections, Lord God, with all of its problems, with all of its past and present and future things that will miss the mark, I pray that you will grant mercy on us, that you will show grace to us, that you will cause the body of Christ to represent you, that we will not take sides, oh God, we will take directions. We will live as though our citizenship is in heaven. But while we're here, Father, we will engage in that which you have called us to be, salt and light. Give us, O oh Lord God, the flavor of heaven, that when we speak, O oh God, we will speak in such a way that others might taste and see that you are good. That when we act, Father God, we will not act according to our flesh, according to our emotions, according to what we think. But we simply will say, yes, Lord. If we have to endure, Father God, give us the strength to endure. When we overcome, Father God, let us know that it is not by our strength, but by yours alone. And when we shout the victory, we will do so in the name of the one that gave us victory. Thank you, Jesus, for overcoming death hell and the grave. Thank you, Jesus, for overcoming all of the traps in the world. Thank you, Jesus, for setting us in high places. That while we're in this world, we are in it, but we are not of it. So remind us, O oh God, of who we are and whose we are. And we will endure in Jesus' name. Answer every prayer today, Father God. Meet every need. Move every mountain and show yourself glorious, merciful and kind. For we submit everything we have, everything we are to you in Jesus name. Father God, if someone is watching right now from a sick bed, from a hospital room, from a place of uncertainty, even of pain, oh God, I pray that in Jesus name you will manifest your presence right there. Right there, oh God, in the place where people feel as though loneliness is their best friend. As though hopelessness has set up camp in their life. As though they want to simply shut off the world and let whatever happens, happens. I speak against, oh God, the spirit of depression I speak against, oh God, the spirit of suicide and self-harm. I speak against every demonic power that is seeking to devour your people. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you will set the captives free. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and upon us. And we declare freedom to those in bondage right now. We command the darkness to leave. In Jesus' name, Lord, we bind on earth that which stands against the glory of God showing up. And you said, Father God, what we bind on earth, you will bind in heaven. So let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in the midst of your people, in the midst of your church. For we submit it all to you in the one name in which every knee shall bow. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth that at the name of Jesus so be it let it be done now and forever in Jesus name amen amen come on speak your own amen come on 
Surround us in this place. Go right there. here in this place that you're not just just observing but you're participating in worship worship again is the price of admission into God's presence and I say that just because Psalm 100 says enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts or his courtyard with praise we studied here at friendship the what, what I call the three levels of worship, the courtyard experience. That's the big broad place, 75 by 150. And that's where you first enter into the tabernacle structure. In that place, there was a, a brass altar and a brass basin. They symbolize the place where you bring your sacrifices, or the sacrifices that blot out your sins and allow you to go the next step are in that place, the brass altar. That place signifies in the New Testament the cross of Jesus. That's the altar that we bring all of our cares to because it was there that God took care of our sin debt. It was there that God blotted away our sins by allowing Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, the atoning lamb, to wash us. And in that brass basin, that's where we would be washed. That's where that's significant of being baptized. Jesus takes care of our sins, and then we're baptized as an outward expression of an inward change, but also in conjunction with that. But then there's another place called the holy place. It's not a place of brass. It's, it's, uh, it's past what might be the second veil. In that place, everything is gold. Gold table of showbread, God's provision. The golden lampstand, God's power. And the golden altar of incense, that's the praise and the worship. Only priests can go into that place, and we as believers are called a royal priesthood. But then there's that third level, the deepest, most intimate level. It is a room, or was a room in the Old Testament that was only 15 by 15. And in that place was the Ark of the Covenant. That signifies the very presence of God. And so you can't just walk into God's presence. You have to through those levels. We enter into his gates and his yards with worship then we come into the holy place and that's where we get involved there's the introduction of the courtyard there's the involvement of the holy place come on but then there's the intimacy of the holy of holies God is drawing us and we begin with an attitude of worship of thanksgiving for the cross of Christ Thank you, Lord, for washing me and cleansing me and calling me your own. Now I live to serve you. Now I get involved. I'm no longer an observer. I'm a participant. But oh, to hear God call you just a little bit deeper, call you just a little bit closer 
into that place, the holy of holies. So worship God when you have a chance. Not only on Sundays, but throughout the week. Invite the presence of God. Ask the Lord to surround you in this place. That place might be your car as you're driving across the 605 freeway stuck in traffic. That place might be in line where someone is way too close or not wearing their mask. Yes, oh God, surround me in this place. I need some protection that a mask can't give me. I need some protection, oh God, that social distancing can't provide. I need the protection of the presence of God. The Spirit of God around us should be like a hazmat suit. Y'all know what a hazmat suit is? Hazardous material. That means that I can enter into hazardous places because I know I'm protected by the armor of God. Man, I, I got like 17, I got about 22 different sermons just percolating in me, but come on, right now, learn how. When, 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 when you hear worship, get involved. Don't just listen, participate in it and give God glory. Well, again, thank you all. Come on and just bless him. I hear some hand claps in the various houses of worship. Thank you, Father God. Again, we, we, we thank you all for the time that you're investing, and, and, and I don't want to use the time spending. I hope you don't see this as just spending about an hour and a half with us here at Friendship, but that this really is an investment, a kingdom investment that you make by pouring out of your spirit, pouring out of, of, of what God has given to you back into the kingdom work, and God has a way of turning that thing around in your life. There's a song we used to sing, and still, you can't beat God giving. Now, that's just not a, a song about tithes. It's about giving to God. Give, give, give God worship everything that we have. And so thank you so much for joining the, the Friendship family. Pray that all is well in your heart and that you're checking in with your small group leaders. Pray that you're checking in with the church office and that we in turn are checking in with you. Because we know again that in this time, the longer this season of, of, of separation and isolation uh, goes on that, that, that perhaps the wherewithal, perhaps the strength of some might wane. So we want to be a word of encouragement to you, not only on Sundays, but throughout the week. So stay in touch with us, and we're going to do our best to stay in touch with you. Our prayer theme for this week is taken from Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power. Come on, somebody. You shall receive, that's the promise of God. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We need power in this season. Power to endure, power to carry on, power to just be who God has called us to be. And the promise of God is you shall receive. We shall, and we have, if you know Jesus, received that power. But think about this too, is that Paul encouraged Timothy that even though we have the power, sometimes we need to stir up the gift that's in us. So come on, we can receive it, and I pray that we have it, but then don't just let it sit and grow idle. You've just got to stir it up. Come on, just, just somebody in the comment section might just want to type that in there. Stir up the gift. Because somebody needs to hear that from someone other than me. Praise God. The gift of God, Acts 1-8. So that is our prayer theme. Also, um, today, we celebrate another one of our young adults, Emmanuel Vera. Come on, man. Listen. Emmanuel just graduated with his master's in Latin American studies with a concentration in Afro-Latino students in higher education. Come on. Come on. Y'all, no, no, no. Y'all need to praise God for that. Emmanuel's story, man, he has an incredible testimony. We have been walking with that brother, and he's been walking with us. He's gone through some, some, some difficult seasons in his life, but I, he held on to his faith, and God has richly rewarded him. So continue to pray for Emmanuel, continue to pray for his family, continue to pray for everybody, all of our young adults, our, our youth, those that are still in the, the educational uh, processes. Pray also for teachers. Amen that in this season of, of kids coming back and, and pray for school ad, administrators. Again, these are uncharted waters, and we are seeking to navigate as leaders in various capacities in ways that bring God glory. So pray for school districts, pray for superintendents, pray for teachers, pray for aides, pray for cafeteria workers, pray for everybody that is being affected 
by this. But let's also pray for our students and young adults. And again, we thank God for them. Our men's ministry, men of valor. Two brothers to my left. One would form all men that there is a place uh, to reach out for support, encouragement, and insight into God's Word. Every Saturday from 8 to 10, there is a Zoom meeting for our men of valor that you can join. Please reach out to Deacon David Hairston or call the church office for this information. It is also in the weekly blast because iron sharpens iron. Amen. We as brothers, we as people of God, but, but sometimes specifically the brethren, we need to stay in each other's company to, to, to stay focused, to, to stay sharp, because, you know, sometimes, um, I, I, it, it, it might be true, you know, but, but sometimes a thing can become dull by non-use. And sometimes when we don't utilize our faith, sometimes when, 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 when we're not challenged as, you know, brothers to, to be about what God has called us to be, sometimes we can get a, get a little dull, you know, so tune into the men's ministry and uh, you will be sharpened, you will be encouraged, and you will be blessed. Also, uh, don't forget that when you shop through Amazon, shop through Amazon.Smile.com. That is, oh, I'm sorry, Smile.Amazon.com. That means that every time that you utilize the Amazon app, just like with our, um, our script program of, of the past, Amazon will donate a portion of what you um, uh, spend on Amazon to the nonprofit of your choice. So if you have not yet done that, uh, go on Amazon, look up for Amazon Smile, and uh, put, put in Friendship Pasadena Church uh, so that when you bless yourself, you will bless us. I just, I, I don't mind telling you, I just blessed myself uh, yesterday with, with, with a, come on, anybody else getting, 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 getting some Amazon blessing? No. Well, brother, we're going to pray for all y'all because somebody ain't being truthful in this place. Amazon, amen, is a friend that sticks closer. Amen, like when you feel a little something, they call Amazon, you feel better for a minute until you get that statement. So <laughs> Amazon, what? Amazon, smile. Y'all look, laughter is good for the, the soul. So please plug in to Amazon. Uh, yes, but also uh, make sure that you're plugging into the website, that you're checking on uh, the Facebook page, that you're checking our, our social media uh, platforms, because again, we want to be a source of encouragement to you a source of information. We want to be a constant stream of blessing into your life, just like you, the Friendship family, and those of you that are um, uh, a part of our extended family. As you continue to support and bless us, we are able to do incredible things beyond even this live, live stream because of the prayers, the support, the encouragement, and the financial blessing that comes into this house. Tithes and offerings are the primary source of financial blessing in a house of worship like friendship. And I again want to encourage the friendship family and all of you that have just um, um, taken a liking to what it is that God is doing here by sending your support, your financial support, because we believe according to God's word that when we sow financial seeds or any kind of seeds into a kingdom work, that we have the promise and the assurance of God's word that God is going to return that back to us. It may not be a dollar for dollar blessing because God gives so much more to us than we ever can. So whatever you sow, the seed of faith that you sow, whatever that is, we know and believe that God returns that back to us in faith fruit, that whatever we really need in our lives, God has a way of showing up in that. So if you're a tither, as Janine and I have the opportunity of being this, this, this morning, which is 10% of whatever comes into your financial control, or if you're giving an offering just above and beyond that, I pray that you would, even if you've already given it, just get it in your mind, get it in your hand, and let's lift up these gifts and pray that God will bless them as we sow into the, the kingdom. Come on, let's confess what we know God is about to do. This is the offering I bring to God, the seed of faith I sow. I give it in faith, I give it in love, I give it in obedience. I believe the promise that he has made, and I shall reap the harvest that he has promised, however he chooses, to bring it my way. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord, 
for the gift and the giver. We thank you for the opportunity that is ours to sow out of our financial excess, oh God. And even, Father God, if it's not excess, it's in absolute obedience. I pray that you return, oh God, multiplied times above and beyond that which is sown today. I pray that you bless, Lord, the gift and the giver. I pray also that you bless those who have a desire, but today may not have the means. Increase their faith. Increase their store of seed so that they might know the joy of sowing and reaping. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God bless you as you give. Come on. Come on, if you know that God is able, put your hands together right there. Come on. We're going to groove for Jesus one time. Here we go. One, two, three, say. He's able. Come on. If you really know it, say. He's able. Come on, open up your mouth and say it if you really mean it. He's able. He's able. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is able. Hallelujah. I'll say that again just in case somebody didn't hear me or don't believe me. God is able. Oh, yes, he is. And my Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond everything that we can even ask, think, or imagine. Have you thought about the fact that God's word says that God is able to do more than you can even imagine? I've got an imagination. I don't know about anybody else, but I have an imagination. Sometimes I've got to try to rein my imagination in. But when I think about what God desires to do, what I think God wants, even what I think and imagine I can do in Jesus, Scripture says that my God is able to do more than I can even imagine according to the power that is at work in us. We talked earlier about the prayer theme. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And if you're a believer today, 
The power to do more than you can even imagine already resides in you. All you have to do is learn how to access that. All you have to learn to do is to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean into your own understanding in all your ways. God will direct your paths. So come on, let's go to the Word of God today. Take your Bibles in your hand. Grab your Bible app. Grab your access point to the Word of God. And let's get into this Word today because I believe God has a Word for us if we will but hear it. So take your Bibles in your hand, raise it before the Lord, and only if you believe these words, let's say them together. This is my Bible. This is God's Word speaking to me. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. It is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. With it I wage war against the enemy of my soul. I will fight the good fight. I will contend for the faith. I will uphold the honor of God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and praise God. I have a message somewhere in my repertoire called, yes, I have a ministry repertoire called Them's Fighting Words. It was a message the Lord dropped on my heart when we kind of came with that confession of faith, that when you, when you make that kind of a declaration into the spirit realm, what you're doing is you're declaring war on everything that has declared war on you. When you say, this is, this is my Bible, I, there's, <laughs> y'all know I think way too much about movies. But there's a movie called Full, Full Metal Jacket. It's not for the squeamish. But there's something that they teach the soldiers. And they, I don't know the whole thing, but they say, this is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. This is my Bible. Oh, there's many like it, but this one is mine. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I will uphold the honor of God at all costs because the word of God is my source, my strength, and my supply. And when you make that declaration, you are telling the devil, come on, come on with it. I've got a weapon. I've got some armor. I've got the sword of the spirit, and I trust God to be my sword and my shield. The Lord is my strength and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I told you I got 22 sermons, but I'll go to the one that I prepared for this morning. Hallelujah. The last few weeks actually have turned into somewhat of a, uh, a series. I mean, I, it's not what I would call a series in the truest sense of what I try to do, what I pray God grants grace to do, because I like teaching in series, not just, you know, shotgun messages. And any word that comes out of the word of God, I, I did not mean and do not mean to diminish any word that comes from the scripture, even if it's not connected to a previous scripture. But I like I, to, to teach and preach in series, one, that it gives some continuity and flow that we can walk with during the week and during the month. But I, this, as I thought about how the God has dropped these messages in my heart the last few weeks, we talked a few weeks ago about Caleb, and Caleb had a different kind of spirit. You remember, if you've been watching, we talked about Caleb and how Caleb was one of the original two spies, well, actually one of the original 12 spies, and only he and Joshua, two of the 12, came back with the report that we can do it. No matter how big the giants, no matter how terrible the land is, no matter what everybody else says, we can do it. But, you know, Caleb was outvoted, and so he had to endure the desert experience, not of his own making, but the desert experience of the decision of, of others for 40 years. And so 45 years later, when, when Caleb was 85, God finally brought him into the promised land, and Caleb said, listen, here I am. It took me a while to get here, but here I am. And I think I've tried to encourage somebody with that statement. It, it might take you a while to get to that place that God has promised you. You might still be in the desert. Watch this, a desert not even of your own making. You might still be reaping the consequences of someone else's decision making. But if you hold on to God's unchanging hand, come on, time is filled with swift transition. Not on earth a move can stand. Build your hope on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Caleb held on to God's unchanging hand. And then he said, here I am, and I don't want no soft play. I want the hill country. I want to still fight giants in my old age. And so we learned that Caleb had a different kind of spirit. Then last week we, we talked about Peter. 
and sometimes how you need to have Peter if you want to pass this, this, this test of learning how to walk on water, right? Principles for supernatural living. And so today there's another person that I want to focus on that I believe as we look at the context of this person's first meeting of Jesus and Jesus coming in in a powerful way into this person's life that you still need to have a certain, a different kind of spirit because this message this morning I've entitled as extreme Christianity. Extre we, we live in an extreme world. I actually was, was, was thinking of, of, of titling this uh, message radical Christianity. Uh, I don't know if, if you've been watching the news and just paying uh, attention, but the word radical has been showing up a lot on the political front. You hear a lot about the radical right and the radical left. And, you know, there's these radicals up in the mountains, you know. They're armed with assault weapons, and, you know, they're very, very radical. And, and, and you know, and, 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 and no one seems to be, you know, just kind of cool and laid back anymore. We are living in a very radical time. And so I believe that the body of Christ in the things of God need to get radical. I believe that in the body of Christ, in the people of God, we need to rise to the extreme levels of what it means to be a believer in this day and age because I truly believe that, again, that Christianity, as it is defined by many people, has really lost its, 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 its genuineness, lost its ability to change the world like God says that, that we should, has perhaps kind of disconnected from God's power, and we have now aligned ourselves in some ways with the world's power. Sometimes those who call themselves Christian, they seem to align themselves as much, if not more so, with the political party than they do with the kingdom party. We learned in our Bible study that, again, God does not take sides. God gives commands. When Joshua crossed the um, Jordan River, he encountered an angel, and an angel was standing there like, like a man fully armed for war with a sword in his hand, and Joshua stepped to him and said, are you for us or for our enemies? And he said, neither, but as a commander of the armies of the Lord have I come. And so when I believe that when God calls the people out, God does not call us to take sides. God calls us to take direction. And so God is directing I believe a radical church to engage a radical word, world with a radical word that will change us from the inside out. Christianity is not this hodgepodge of beliefs that we've kind of pieced together that looks more like our political party, more like our social identity, more like what we've made God out to be, as opposed to the God who's going to show himself, the Jesus that's about to reveal himself to a man who thought he had a relationship with God, a very religious man, but he really didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And friendship, you know that I've, I have, I believe, coined this phrase, that religion without relationship is idolatry. That no matter how strong your religious beliefs might be, if they are not formed and crafted directly from God's word, directly from a genuine meeting and the lordship of Christ, then we have made a religious system that we're comfortable with that really may not reflect the glory of the Lord. And so today I want us to go to the book of Acts, and I want to go to chapter 9, and I want us to meet up with a man who at this stage, his name is Saul. Not the King Saul of the Old Testament, but a very religious, zealous individual whose heart, as far as he knew it, was seeking to do and accomplish the will of God because he was very, very religious. As a Pharisee, he knew the law, the Old Testament law, the Old Testament covenant of how God was relating with, with people according to the standards of an old covenant. But he was about to come into contact with the writer, the author of the new covenant, 
a covenant written in his own blood, that being Jesus Christ, and his life was about to change drastically and dramatically. And I believe today that if we are going to be the kind of people that God is calling for in 2020, that we need to walk in and have an extreme kind, a radical kind of Christianity. Radical as defined by the Spirit of God, not radical as defined by the emotions of the world. So Acts chapter 9, I'm going to read about 22 two verses. So I want you all to follow along, and then we're going to break this thing down into what I believe are going to be some bite-sized components that I really pray are going to help you. Acts chapter 9, meanwhile. Every time I hear the word meanwhile, my mind always goes to like a comic book or goes to something where a story is being told in one place, and then they hit you with meanwhile. Meanwhile means at the same time that something else is happening, that another set of circumstances are happening. Now, the meanwhile kind of goes back to chapter 8. Because meanwhile, there, there's a man by the name of Philip. And Philip, as an evangelist, has gone out and he is now preaching the gospel. He's encountered the first Ethiopian missionary who was um, a, a uh, eunuch. And he was over the affairs of a queen by the name of Candace. And this Ethiopian eunuch had come to Jerusalem to worship. But on his way home, he had kind of pulled off to the side of the road, and in his chariot, he's reading the scripture in the book of Isaiah that's talking about the suffering of the Messiah. And the Spirit of God speaks to Philip and says, go over there and just kind of hang out and listen to what he's reading. Philip walks up to him. Matter of fact, it, it says that Philip ran to him and asked him, do you really understand what you're reading? I pray that question be asked and answered of everybody who's ever picked up the Bible because there's a lot of people reading the Scripture. There's a lot of people quoting the Scripture, but I really wonder, do you really understand what it is that you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch came clean, said, how can I understand it unless somebody explains it to me? And it says from that moment, Philip began to teach him about Jesus. And as they're traveling, they come to a body of water. The Ethiopian eunuch says, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip baptizes him. And once he comes out of the water, Philip is taken away. And the Ethiopian eunuch goes away praising God. That's why we call him by we. I mean, people that believe this kind of thing. He became the first evangelist to Ethiopia. He carried the message of Jesus back with him to a place that even now in modern thinking is the cradle oft times thought of as the cradle of Christianity in that part of the world. Because I don't know if, if you follow anything on your Facebook feed, but there's a lot of people that kind of talk about, you know, Christianity coming to the U.S. in a certain period of time and, you know, black folks only be, became Christian, you know, after the fact. But this happened thousands of years ago. That the gospel message to Ethiopia, which is in Africa, was taken long before any of us got here. So, you know, y'all who want to talk that stuff out your neck, we can have that conversation later. But the Bible says that the word of God reached an Ethiopian, and therefore I believe he took that message back. But so when we're talking about meanwhile, other powerful things are going on at the same time. But at the same time, while great and glorious things are happening, somebody still hasn't got the message. And I think that right now, that while there are people that are being tremendously blessed during this pandemic, people that are having all their needs met and really aren't struggling like other folks are and really, you know, are just... Thanking God. There are people that have gotten jobs. There are people who have gotten blessed. I've talked to folks that if it wasn't for the circumstances and situations of the virus, they wouldn't have seen this door open. So there are some folks that are almost thanking God. Lord, thank you for this season. But there's a lot of other folks, meanwhile, who are struggling. There's a lot of other folks, meanwhile, that don't really know what it is to trust God in a season like this. So meanwhile, Acts 9 Verse 1, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. Let me take you back to the other side of meanwhile. Because there was another man by the name of Stephen 
who was an evangelist like Philip. But Stephen met a different kind of end. Stephen was murdered because of his faith. Stephen was stoned to death because he dared to oppose religion and try to introduce a relationship. And Paul was probably not a contributor to his death, but Paul agreed with it. Paul did not participate, but Paul was in agreement. And so Paul's guilt, even though he may not have thrown a stone, Paul was like the coat check boy. That when everybody was stoning, they gave Paul their, their cloak so, that, so they're throwing on. Come on, I don't mean to, 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 to diminish the importance of this. But they took off their outer garment so that they could stone a man to death. And Saul, not yet Paul, gave consent, but he was watching their jackets. So again, Paul again believes that the religion of the land is going forth, but he has yet to have an extreme encounter with this Christianity that we know. So Paul was still breathing out of murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's what they called Christianity before it became known as the Christian church. They would be called the way. The way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus, in other words, he was on the Damascus road. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now, get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Let's just keep on reading. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named Tars from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias said, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. The Lord said to Ananias, go! This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Let me inject this. Sometimes when God gives you a great calling, you're going to have to endure great problems. Sometimes. When God has a great calling on your life, it's not going to be as easy as you might think it is. Because God says, I'm using this man, not only speak to Gentiles, but to the kings and my people, and I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't this the man who raked havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? 22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Extreme. Matter of fact, even as I'm thinking, let's alter that. I don't know if we can actually change. 
in the, let's make this radical, Christianity. Radical. It still works with extremes, so if we can't change it and you can't change it, don't worry about it. But I just want to go back and forth with radical. Paul had a radical. Paul had a genuine. Point number one, that in radical Christianity, in extreme Christianity, what is essential for any person who wants to walk with the Lord and know that God's hand is on you, you, we all must have, here's number, here's number one, a genuine encounter with Jesus. Whatever that looks like in your life, however God, through Jesus Christ, shows up in your life, I believe that for us to have this kind of radical, internal, supernatural thing that God only pours out on those who he wants to use in this season, that you need to have a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ himself. I'm not talking about just a great day in church. I'm not just talking about hearing a powerful, stirring message. I'm not just talking about being moved by your emotions. I'm talking about where Jesus Christ, the living Lord, the one who defeated death, ascended to the right hand of the Father and showed up in Paul's life in a bright light that however the Lord chooses to show up in our lives, we need that kind of encounter because without that kind of, of encounter, we will make excuses, we will substitute religion, We'll be swayed by politics and social points of view. But when you've, had, when you've heard from the Lord yourself, then nothing else will matter. No other voice can move you the way that God can move you when Jesus speaks. Some of you may have had a dream. Some of you may have had some supernatural encounter. Some of you may have heard a sermon or some kind of way. You have felt the presence of God in your life. And that means that you're changed forever. Don't forget that Paul was a very religious person. Paul was somebody that believed that he was doing the right thing. That according to the Old Testament law, anybody that stood against what the Old Covenant told was correct deserved death. And when Stephen said, listen, I see the Lord, I see this Jesus who dared to come into your religious world and tell you that he was the only way to salvation. This Jesus who now has kind of erased all of the religious expectations of what you can and cannot do. A, a, a merit-based system of being good enough. A merit-based system of somehow that if you just stop something long enough that God is now obligated. God is not obligated to do anything other than be God. And when Jesus shows up, we fall at his feet like Paul did. Paul didn't say, don't you know who I am? See, that's one of our biggest problems is when we come to the Lord, we come under our own strength. Don't you know who I am? I'm the president of this company. I'm a self-made person. Ever heard this saying that if you're self-made, you ain't made much? I've heard that said in, from time to time. I'm a self-made millionaire. Well, you haven't made a whole lot. Because when you come to the Lord, Paul was a person of stature and status even at that time. And he was pursuing his religion with a zeal that exceeded a lot of what, what was even necessary. Word had got out about this man who was so zealous for his religious belief that he was willing to do anything to take anybody and put them in chains and perhaps even watch them stoned to death if they opposed what Paul believed was religiously accurate until he had a genuine encounter with Jesus. Jesus will mess with your religion. A genuine encounter with Jesus will mess you up forever. That's why Paul didn't say, don't you know who I am? The right question is, Lord, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Even Jesus asked his own disciples, well, who do men say? See, that's a, that's a question I think that a lot of people have to answer today. That when you talk about Jesus, when you talk about him, if you talk about him at all, or if you hear other people talk about it, who is Jesus really to you? What do other people say? What, what, what do the Buddhists say? Or who do the Buddhists say? Who do the Muslims say? Who do the Scientologists say? Who do the atheists say? Who do the Baptists? Who do the Methodists? Who do the apostolic people say that Jesus really is? And with all the people that I just mentioned, you're probably going to get a little bit of a different answer. Who do the Mormons say? Who does your mama say with all due respect to your mama? Who do others say that I am? And each one of them 
had their own answer. And Jesus said, all right, cool. Now let me ask you, who do you say? What is your opinion? Now I'm looking right at you. I'm looking into this camera lens, but I'm looking at whoever's looking back into my eyes. Let me ask you a question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he who you say he is? Or he, is he who he says he is? Is he king of kings? Is he Lord of lords? Is he Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end? Is he the one that defeated death and rose on the third day? Is he the one that will one day return to this earth and rule and reign as king of kings and Lord of lords? Is he the one that can heal your diseases? Is he the one, the only one that can forgive you of your sins? Because if, if he is not that, then you probably got the wrong guy. Because when you have a genuine encounter with Jesus, something is going to change. You are going to have a radical transformation. Somebody put it like this. They said, you, no one can ever meet Jesus and stay the same. Oh, you may have heard about him. You may have had that little warm, fuzzy feeling that somebody told you was the Lord. And I'm not going to say that it may not have been the Spirit. But just because you felt the Spirit, just because you heard his voice just because you've seen glimpses of his glory doesn't necessarily mean that he has set up his kingdom in your heart so Paul has this encounter that radically changes who he was forever Paul had a genuine encounter with Jesus we talked about Moses and the burning bush. God got Moses' attention. Moses was a Hebrew, probably raised as a Hebrew, knowing the Hebrew laws, knowing the old covenant. But somehow when he stepped in and he saw the burning bush, then God began to speak to him. We need to have a burning bush experience. We need to have a, a Damascus Road experience. We need to have a yes Jesus experience. We need to have a personal encounter with the Lord because that is the only way that we're going to be able to step into this radical world unless we've been radically changed. God does not come in just to, just, just, just to tinker and change. God wants to overhaul your entire system. God wants to change the way you think. God wants to change the way you walk. God wants to change the way you talk. God wants to change the way you live. God wants to change the way you interact with people. God wants to change the way you wait. God wants to change the way you cry. God wants to change the way you endure. God wants to change everything about you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet, but that only happens when you have a genuine encounter with Christ because Paul began to be changed in that moment from a religious zealot to a man who said, I know who Jesus is. Oh, I heard about him. Some even suggest that, that Paul may have no evidence of this scripturally at all. Paul may have heard Jesus because they were contemporaries as far as age and Jesus hadn't been gone that that long and so if he was in the area maybe maybe he swung by one of the you know the hillside ministries maybe he saw him on the street because Jesus didn't have you know bodyguards he was just kind of hanging out who knows but the fact is that Paul that Saul was still Saul God is about to, help me, Father God, this was something I wasn't even going to get into. God is about to change not only the nature of Paul, but Saul. Saul will no longer be known as Saul. God is going to change the very nature of a religious man by the name of Saul and make him an appointed apostle by the name of Paul. One of the most prolific writers of the of the new covenant, which again, on my Facebook feed, there are these very religious people who are talking about, well, Paul wasn't even an apostle because he never really met Jesus, which means that you know nothing about the scripture because the Bible says that Paul had a genuine encounter. And Paul is not writing this book. This is not written by Paul. This is written by someone else who they believe was Luke. So Luke is testifying that this actually happened. Sometimes you need somebody else to testify. Listen, I knew that cat back in the day. I knew that sister back in the day. And the person that she is now, the person that he is now, ain't nothing like the brother, nothing like the sister that they used to be. Come on, sometimes you just need somebody to toot your own horn. Sometimes you need somebody to tell your story. Because when you tell your story, may not nobody believe, but let me tell you about 
about that sister. Let me tell you about that brother. Somebody needs to stand there and say, listen, I knew that cat back in the day, and the things that he's doing today don't make no sense, but, I, but the only thing that I had an encounter with Jesus for myself, I'm still a work in progress. But hallelujah, if we're going to be radical, if we're going to step into 2020, with a radical mindset, we need to go back to the fact that we can no longer just have an encounter with church. You can join churches every day of your life. You can walk down aisles and they can pour buckets of oil on you. And you can be baptized 67 times in water. But unless God gets your attention, unless Jesus shows up in your life, you need to have a genuine encounter with Christ. Because otherwise, you will wake up from that and go right back. Because here's point number two, is that not only will you have a, a genuine encounter with Jesus, you will have a dramatic change of direction. We find Paul on the Damascus Road as a, a religious zealot and persecution of the church. But when Jesus gets his uh, attention, next time you find Paul, he's on a street called Straight. Some of y'all on the wrong street. I'm just... Some of us are still on the Damascus Road. Because wide is the way, and broad is the gate that leads to this destruction. And the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man. But the end is that Paul on the Saul on the Damascus Road was on a way that seemed right. He was expressing his religion to the best of his ability, but then Jesus stopped him dead in his tracks. And basically told him the same thing. Because other translations say it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's hard for you to kick against the thorns. Your entire life with all of your zeal is kicking against the thing that God is designed to turn you. But some of us are so stubborn. I don't want to say us because somebody's going to text me. Who are you talking to, Pastor? I don't even know who I'm talking to. Uh, have you ever heard this, this saying too? Stuff like this always gets me in trouble. But, you know, if you throw a rock... And I don't want to use the right, if you, the duck, the duck that quacks is the one that got hit. I just changed the animals to protect the innocent. So something in you right now is kind of stirring. I, don't, I can't see you, but the Spirit of God is speaking to you. Because Saul was a religious zealot who was dead set doing what he thought was right until he met Jesus and then he ended up going from the Damascus Road to a little old street called Straight Street because God always will give you a dramatic change of direction if you're going the same way you were when you first heard Jesus you're probably still on your own Damascus Road if you know all the turns if you know all the streets if you know all of the places to hang out and you're not in any new territory, experiencing any new experiences, you very well might be. I'm speaking in the realm of the spirit. You very well, very well might still be on your own Damascus Road. But until God shows up in your life, watch what he does. Because now Paul can't even see. Paul is now blind. One of the biggest things I think that God has to do is blind us to our own thought processes. God has to blind us to the familiarity of the direction that we're used to going. Help me, Father God, this morning. Because Paul was struck blind, and they had to lead him by the hand. I pray today that the Spirit of God, in Jesus' name, in the realm of the Spirit, will begin to cause your eyesight your natural eyesight to begin to get a little blurry. Things that you used to focus on, things that you thought that you wanted, things that you were after, things that you really believe that God may have given you, that if God is not saying that that is my best for you, that they will begin to lose their luster, that you'll begin to lose focus on the things that really don't matter because God is going to change the way you see things once he gets you off of the path that you've decided was, right. who in the world am I talking to? I pray in Jesus' name that God is going to cause you to realize that when you've had, number one, a genuine encounter with, with Jesus, that you will have, number two, a dramatic change of direction. Because God always alters your course. Scripture says somewhere, I believe it's in the book of Isaiah, that we can get to a place where we'll literally hear 
in the spirit, the voice of the Lord behind us saying, this is the way. Go in it when you turn to the right and to the left. That's why thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Jesus is the living word. And so when I get off, when I get off the path, all I got to do is go back into the word. But watch this. I can look in the word and still miss the path if my eyes have not been blinded to what I think as opposed to what he says. If I had a microphone, I would drop it. Because God, listen, God is looking for radical people. If you wake up and you turn on the TV or maybe you're living so that, that you don't want to know, we live in a radical world. Everything has been radicalized in this world. And somehow the church just believes that we can, well, I just hold on and make, God did not save you to ho just to hold on. God did not give you his dunamis power just to hold on. God did not get your attention just to hold on. He's got a work for you to do. Some of you have to speak to some folks. Some of you have to go some places and do some things and endure some stuff. And it's going to take a radical change in your life and my life to accomplish the will of God in this day and age. 2020 is not for the squeamish. 2020 is not for the weak. I know we were, 2020 was going to be so clear, man. I see so well now, and I'm like, Lord, put the blinders back on. Let me close my eyes, man. I don't like what I'm looking at. Come on, I, I, I hear Neo in the Matrix. When he woke up, he said, why do my eyes hurt? He said, because you've never used them before. Because they've been open to what you thought was right. But when God's open, you know, watch this. Paul, Saul is just now being changed. And for three days and three nights, he said he don't eat. There's something in there to fasting, too. Some of us, <laughs> a Facebook friend of mine said that he is now COVID thick. He had gained about 20 pounds. Because you know when you're sitting around watching TV, you know, popcorn and all this other kind of stuff? Some of us need to fast just because. <laughs> don't, don't get mad at me. <laughs> I'm just speaking into the air. So, so some of us need to fast. So, so, some. But Paul doesn't eat for three days. Because he's now, the direction of his life has been radically changed. The Lord has showed up in something radical. Now here's the third point, is that when you live in a radical or an extreme sense of Christianity, number one, after a genuine encounter with Christ, number two, after a dramatic change in, in direction, uh, number three, there will be a noticeable ability to see things clearly. When God gets your attention, you'll... Just when you look at things, they don't look the same anymore. Stuff that I found attractive doesn't look the same anymore. Things that I thought I wanted, I don't want anymore. Because the Bible says that something like scales fell off of Paul's eyes. Some of us are living with scales on our eyes that only when a radical encounter with Jesus can change. Because as long as we see things the way we always have, we'll never see things the way God reveals them. Because the thing called the word revelation simply means to uncover. I was going to go to have y'all go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, what verses I, 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 I put up there? Yeah, three. But it, let me tell you what that speaks to. It speaks to the fact that there was a time, it says that Moses had to put a veil over his face because the glory of God was on his body. So when people came for direction from, from Moses, they just saw the veil and heard the words. But it says that only when you come to Jesus is the veil taken away because even now you can read the Bible. Even now you can hear a message like this. Even now you can sense the presence of God on you. But until the veil is removed, until the scales fall, until you begin to see with the spiritual eyes that God has given us, Ephesians 1, friendship, you should know this well. Paul said, the same Paul to the Ephesians church said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your spirit might be open. When Adam and Eve were living in direct obedience to God, they saw with spiritual eyes and they were not aware of their own nakedness. But the Bible says that the moment they sinned, 
another set of eyes opened, and they were then keenly aware of their limitations. We need to begin to ask God, Lord, I want to go in the spirit. I want to go blind to the things that lead me away from you. I want to go blind, Lord, to the things that I see when I watch the news. I want to go blind to the things that I see, to the stuff that always entices me to go the wrong way because I want to be able to see differently. There's this thing called laser surgery, which is the exact opposite of what us as kids were told to do. Your mama or your father would tell you, don't look directly into a bright light, right? Because you'll go blind. Now, they tell us, in order for you to see better, look directly into this bright light. <laughs> Come on. Look directly. Look directly into the bright light. Look directly into the face of Jesus. Look directly into the glory of God. Look directly at what God has called for you. And God with laser-like precision will give you a new set of eyeballs that will give you the ability to see things in the spirit that you never knew existed. You'll realize that you've been looking at what you thought you wanted and all the time it's been a pile of trash. It's been a bunch of garbage. But God will give you laser-like focus when you look directly into his word. Paul looked directly into the face of Jesus and his natural eyes were blinded. But when God began to speak, the Bible says that something like scales fell off and then instantly Paul could see what he was supposed to see, what he could never see before he became radicalized in the things of Almighty God. Genuine encounter with Jesus. A dramatic change of direction. The noticeable ability to see things clearly. Fourth thing is that now Paul had an urgent desire to share his faith. When God shows up in your life, you get what we used to call back in the day, the can't help it. When you realize that God has radically changed your life, you can't help but tell somebody. You can't help but call, man, I don't know what happened, or I do know. I went to church. I'd, I've been going to church my whole life, but suddenly the Lord got my attention. There are some folks that are listening to me right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, there are people that have been going to church your whole life, and you have yet to encounter Jesus. You have yet to have a radical, transformative move of God because somebody told you that God really doesn't do that anymore, that God doesn't show up like that anymore, that God doesn't expect anything like that. Just be your best self. Try harder, you know, that everybody is a work in progress. How long are you going to be a work in progress before you let God start working on you? You've been working on you your whole life. You've been reading books and you've been watching tapes and you've been working out and you've been eating kale smoothies and you've been doing all of that stuff and you still are the same you. You just look a little bit better. You just, you just smell a little bit better. But you're the same you. You got the same problems. You got the same issue. You walk in the same direction. You got the same habits. And this is not a message trying to bring condemnation. This is a message trying to bring conviction that in this world and this day we need a radical transformation to be the radical people of God. You need to have, number one, you need to have a genuine encounter. Not with church. Not with religion. Not with denominationalism. You need to have a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ, the Son of living God. You need to have a genuine encounter with a God that will dramatically change your direction. You will no longer walk the way you used to walk. You will no longer, you'll still have the same desires because watch this, your spirit gets saved. Your mind just got to catch up. Maybe we'll preach on that later. Your mind don't know who you really are, but your spirit is worn against your flesh and you just wondering why am I still doing the things because God is trying to shift you. God is trying to get you off the Damascus Road and get you on straight street. But when he gets you on straight street, he will open your eyes to who he really is. He's going to send an Ananias and maybe today I'm your Ananias. Maybe God has sent me today to speak to you and to call your name. If I could see your name, I'd call it. But I would say to you that God has sent me to you 
to, re to restore the spiritual sight, to open your spiritual eyes, and so you would be filled with the power of the Spirit of God so that you can go tell somebody, let me tell you what God has done for me. Because the Bible says that immediately Paul began to preach the salvation in the Jesus that just three days ago he was arresting people for. See, it took Peter months and maybe years and then throughout his life peter was a work in progress that's why i'm saying a lot of us are like peter a lot of us make great promises lord i'll serve you till i die until something happens lord i'm i'll i'll i'll, I'll trust you lord until the lights go out a little bit of a testimony a little bit of tmi my refrigerator died last night I'm in genuine mourning because <laughs> we're suffering loss even as I speak it has some stuff in there man I'm serious I'm feeling that in my heart right now because after service we got to go and find another one but you know we're still young we can have another one But my God is a provider. I was wondering how I was going to recover from that one. But radical, radical, extreme Christianity is not for the faint-hearted. It's not just for those that are satisfied with religious practice. It's for those who want to live to the fullness of what God has called for them. Saul was a very religious person, zealous in what he believed to be right until he had a genuine encounter with Jesus. And once he had that encounter, he was then blinded to everything that he thought was right. And maybe God has to blind us to what we think is right so he can have somebody else lead us to where we need to go. The Spirit of God wants to take our hand and lead us in a brand new direction. And then when the scales fall off, we'll be able to see clearly. When I look at the world, I don't want to see what I think anymore. I want to see what God says. And I'm going to do my best with the time I have left to tell somebody about this incredible God, about this life-changing, radical God who doesn't just want to make your life harder. He wants to give you the life that he has in store for you. He told Ananias, this guy, Peter, I mean Paul, I mean Saul, he's going to have to suffer some things because where I need to take him is going to be rough. Whatever you're going through right now, I pray that you would acknowledge that perhaps God is just simply leading you in a path to perfect his calling in your life. But here's one thing he always does, is he calls us to the cross. He calls us to his son. He calls us to Jesus. And if you want to be this radical believer today, if you want to accomplish things that God has in store for all of us, I pray that you'll take the radical step if you've never taken it before and simply submit and surrender to the lordship of Jesus that you will have a genuine encounter with Christ. Not church as you know it. Not denomination as we follow it, but Jesus. It begins by saying, Lord Jesus, I've messed up so many times that I'm not even worthy of another ounce of your grace. But I call upon you, Lord, because you are my only hope. And without you, Father God, I will always fall short. I will always miss the mark. I confess, oh God, today that I'm a sinner by nature. But you are a savior by nature. And so change me, Father God. Forgive my sin. Change the direction of my life. Alter the trajectory of my life and place me on a path from Damascus Road to Straight Street and I will forever follow you. I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that God has raised you from the dead. And because of that, your word tells me that I'm saved. If you've done that for the first time and you want to know more because you need to know more, comment in the comment sections. I want to know more about this Jesus. I want to become a radical 
follower of Christ. I want to be a part of extreme Christianity because I live in an extreme world and I want to serve a radical God. I pray today that something in this word, something about this encounter with a very religious man by the name of Saul might resonate somewhere in your spirit and that you'll just say to yourself, I want more because God wants more for me. Come on, body of Christ. Rise to the radical level that God is calling us to. We live in an extreme world and God wants us to be extreme with the love of Jesus and with the power of his spirit. Thank you so much for the time that you spent with us, that you've invested with us. Y'all come up. In this moment in time where the body of Christ is so desperately needed, we need a radical church to face a radical world. God bless you and God keep you. Tumek into Friendship Pasadena on Thursdays at 7 o'clock. We're in the book of Joshua, and I believe that God is going to speak to you even there. So be blessed. Be encouraged, be radical, be extreme. In Jesus' name, God bless you and God keep you. Come on. Whoa, whoa. See, open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. See, open the eyes. Open the eyes of whoa. my heart. See, I want to see you. See, I want to see you. See, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you.